at last. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Through Isaiah, the Lord declared, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. The Apostle Peter exhorted God's people, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In expectation of God's grace then, let us humbly confess our sins to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. Gracious God, because you desire not the death of sinners, but that we turn from our evil ways and live, we come to you in sincere confession of our sins, those sins we know and those we do not know, sins of actions and inaction, sins that are worthy only of punishment and death. For the sake of your son's sacrificial death, cleanse us by his blood and refresh our bodies and souls with your forgiveness and peace. Then turn us to serve you in holiness and pureness of living today and forever. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Good news, people of God. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. His boundless love extends to the cross of Jesus to you. I, therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the Lord, announce God's grace to you. And in the stand and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we confess our Christian faith. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. And you may be seated for the next hymn.
as we continue our Lenten series this year, Overcoming Sin by the Cross of Christ, each week, remember, we're going through a different sin, one that was emulated or exhibited by uh, someone in the passion history of Christ as well. Tonight, we are talking about greed, okay? So all of the scripture readings deal with greed, including this first one from Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived at a time when he was called to be a prophet to the people of God who absolutely just did not want to hear God's word at all. Uh, They thought they had it all figured out and they were all about materialistic kinds of things and going on in their own sinfulness. And they were refusing to listen to Jeremiah. So in this reading, Jeremiah is expressing his frustration. But then God also tells Jeremiah to go with a message that is harsh, a harsh message of condemnation and judgment. Uh, that will come upon the evil people. Jeremiah chapter six, Jeremiah says, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. But I am full of the wrath of the Lord and I cannot hold it in. Pour it out on the children in the street, and on the young men gathered together. Both husband and wife will be caught in it, and the old, those weighed down with years. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. This is the word of our Lord. And then Paul talks about greed as well in Ephesians chapter five. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. This is the word of our Lord. And then the gospel for today is actually two different readings, uh, but two different examples of greed uh, that are right there in the passion history of Christ. The first from John chapter 12 happens the night before Palm Sunday. It happens in a little town called Bethany. A feast is being given for Jesus. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and now it is uh, that setting that we read about. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold 
and the money given to the poor. It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And then the second reading from Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, this part of it, happens right after the Palm Sunday event when Jesus went to the temple and saw the greed and everything that was being exhibited right there uh, in the temple courts. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. This is the gospel of our Lord. Okay, kids, we do have a little children's message here today. If you would, please come on up and have a seat on the floor. Sit on the floor. Okay, very good. I'm going to sit down too. Hi, guys. Come on over. Okay. I told you that each week during Wednesday services, we're going to talk about some of the people that were involved in the story of Jesus' death. It's called his passion, okay? That's what it's technically called. It means his suffering. There were a lot of people involved. We, of course, focus on Jesus as the one who dies to take away our sins, but we ought to know the rest of the people, too. Got to know the full story. Do you remember who I talked about last week? There were two groups of people, in particular, that we talked about. Who were they? Correct. The scribes and the Pharisees. They said that the scribes, these were a group of people. They wrote, hand wrote, the Bible. That was a wonderful thing. They didn't have copy machines. They didn't have computers. So they wrote it out by hand. That was a very, very good thing. But remember, the scribes then thought that they were the best teachers of all because they were in the Word all the time. But they were not teaching what the Bible really taught. They rather made up stuff. They made up stuff on their own. And Jesus did not like that very much at all. Therefore, they didn't like Jesus either. And then the other group was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group of people who thought that the best way to keep the law of God is to make more laws. (laughs) And they went and made up their own. They made up their own laws. Stuff that wasn't in the Bible at all. They just made it up. And then they thought if they kept it, they were doing so wonderfully. And they expected everyone to bow down to them because they were so good at keeping the law. And Jesus looked at them and said, oh, you guys aren't even close. You're just following your own rules. Who cares about that? What we care about is what does God say? So the Pharisees didn't like Jesus either. Scribes and Pharisees really hated him. They're important to understand the story of Jesus' death. But today, I want to talk about one other man. You can see right up there who we're going to talk about. Judas. Judas. Judas was a disciple of Jesus. So he was one of the 12. He was from a town called Kerioth. I don't expect you to remember that, but I want you to know that because sometimes we say Judas Iscariot. Iscariot is not his last name. It just means the town he came from. Judas from Kerioth. That's what it means. Because there was another disciple that was also named Judas. So there were two Judases. So in order to distinguish them, one was called Judas Iscariot. Okay? That's the deal with that. Now what do we need to know about Judas? He started off as probably a very good disciple of Jesus. He wanted to learn about him. He wanted to uh, find out more about what he was like and so on and so forth. 
But then along the way, things changed for Judas. Really changed. And the thing that became most important to him was money. Money. He was the treasurer. In other words, he held the money for the rest of the group. And he didn't hold the money just for the rest of the group. What do you suppose he did with the money? Many times he went and took it for himself. He really did. So a lot of things happened. You heard about one thing today uh, in the first reading that we had. But the most important thing to remember was this. During Holy Week, the scribes and the Pharisees, right, who hate Jesus, wanted to see him dead. And they offered money. They offered money. They said, we will pay 30 pieces of silver to anyone who brings us information about where we can arrest Jesus when he's all alone. Well, you know who took him up on the offer, right? Judas can make 30 pieces of silver. Can make some money. And if it was going to mean that Jesus would have to get arrested, he didn't care anymore. And so he made the deal. He made the deal. He got the money in his hands. Oh, and it looked great. He went and led people from the temple to the place where Jesus was, in a garden, late at night. Judas went up to Jesus like a friend, even kissed him on the cheek. But that was the sign, the sign that he had given to the other guys who were with him. He's the one. Arrest him. It's called a betrayal. Judas betrayed, revealed a secret that led to Jesus' harm. Judas ran away. He had his money. But then all of a sudden, something happened inside of him. That money wasn't what he thought it would be. He thought it'd bring him happiness, thought it'd bring him something good. But now he was feeling guilty. He knew Jesus wasn't guilty of anything to be arrested for. And now this money was just hurting him, and he he didn't know what to do. He actually went back to the scribes and Pharisees who gave him the money and said, here, take this back. It was wrong for me to go and betray Jesus. You shouldn't arrest him. He's not done anything wrong. But the scribes and the Pharisees said, we don't care what you say. We don't care if you feel bad. Tough. Tough. We got Jesus, you got your money, case closed. Now Judas didn't know what to do. He really didn't know what to do. He felt awful. Do you know what he did? He got a rope, threw it over a tree, and he hanged himself. That was pretty sad. Because ultimately, it didn't have to be that way. Judas could have gone to Jesus. Said to Jesus, I did wrong. I'm sorry. Would Jesus have forgiven him? Yeah. 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 That's why the story of Judas is so tragic. He had been with Jesus for three years and he missed the entire message. The message of love and forgiveness, of grace and mercy. And look what happened to him. He committed suicide. We need to know who Judas was. We need to understand what he did. Because that's part of the story. 
the part of the story that puts Jesus on a cross. Yes, it puts Jesus on a cross. Horrible, horrible thing. But it puts him on a cross for our good, right? That our sins can be forgiven. That we don't have to be like a Judas and go and hang ourselves and give up and think it's all hopeless. So we know about Judas, but we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus in faith. And we see our Savior hanging there. Our Savior who loves us, who forgives us. All right? We'll talk about more people next week. Thank you very much. And now we'll sing the next song, Son of God, Eternal Savior. And grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Remember about repentance. Repentance involves confession of sins, but it's not the same as confession of sins. Repentance starts with confession, where we recognize our sins and admit them. That's a hard thing, because most of the times we don't like to do that. And then the second part of repentance is that we receive forgiveness. God had received the forgiveness, otherwise you're still in the despair of sin. That's where Judas was. Judas confessed his sin. He knew he had done wrong, but he never got to the forgiveness part because he didn't even know where it was in Jesus. But we, when we repent, 
We acknowledge our sinfulness. We confess it. Then we receive forgiveness. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's a divine, a divine statement of pardon. Then the third part about repentance. Got confession, forgiveness, and then turn from and turn to. Turn from the evil that you just confessed and stop doing it. And then turn to God and do as he would have us to do. That's our whole theme for this, and we're talking about specific sins as examples. There are many, many others. We're talking about just specific ones this Lenten season. Last week, we talked about hypocrisy. Remember? Hypocrisy. And pointed out that the scriptural use of that word hypocrite means to put on a mask. To put on a mask and then go on a stage basically and act. Act for the applause for the approval of the audience. Instead of acting as yourself, acting in a way you think other people want to see you act so that they will indeed like you. That's being a hypocrite. And we emphasize that as Christians, we don't have to put on masks. In fact, we shouldn't put on masks. And we shouldn't go about acting in particular ways that we expect people will approve as if their approval is so important. We have the approval of God. God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. He has made us children. He has the Heavenly Father. He has equipped us with the Holy Spirit in order to live as God would have us to live in every situation, in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. So there's no reason to be a hypocrite, one who acts, in order to gain something from someone else. We already have the divine approval. We already have all the blessings, so we just go out there shining with the light of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that was last week. Okay, now this week, greed. Greed. The sin is what we're talking about now. And obviously Judas. Judas fits right in with this whole thing. If we know Judas for anything, we probably know him for betrayal. But the underlying thing about the betrayal is greed. Okay, so greed is what we're talking about here today. Now, if we define greed, it's not just about wanting more money. It's not just about wanting more stuff. It is, it is. But really, greed is just wanting more and more and more and more of anything, of whatever a person thinks is significant to them. Wanting to have much, wanting to have the best. And that can be any number of things. Yes, it can be money. It can be possessions. But it can be something also like fame. Some people will just crave the fact that other people acknowledge them and know who they are. Another possible thing that people get greedy about is power. Many political leaders are are just greedy for power. Just greedy for power. And it even happens in, in jobs It even happens uh, in churches where people want to have power and then they act accordingly. Now the question that we have to ask is, why? What is this deal with greed? Where does it come from? Well, where it comes from is inside of us, from our sinful human nature. Our sinful human nature. When you don't have God, okay, don't have the forgiveness, don't have the connection with the Holy Spirit or anything else like that, and you're just left with a sinful human nature, the essence of that human nature, the essence of that sinful human nature is going to be a selfishness that thinks only about self and just wants to get everything for self. All people are born with that, you and I included. You and I included. If indeed we are able to overcome greed right now in our lives, it's because God has entered and God is doing things to help us. But you take God out of the picture, greed can just well up. Well up into all kinds of uh, ramifications, all kind of ways of, of showing it. And Why? For what end? Okay, we got the beginning. The beginning is the sinful human nature. What's the end goal? 
Why do, you, why do people want to get more and more and more and more? Well, obviously, there can be a lot of different answers. Uh, two of them that I want to emphasize today, which I think are probably two of the most significant reasons why people get greedy, is that they have goals of happiness and security. They think that they can be happy by getting lots of stuff, by getting the fame that they crave, by getting the power that they think they deserve. Then they'll be happy. They'll be able to go through life with, with a spring in their steps and, and just a joyful kind of uh, exuberance that they indeed have got everything. They've got the world by a tail and they're excited for themselves and they're just happy about it. Okay. Because <laughs> it doesn't work. And everyone knows that it doesn't work. When you're goal of being happy through greed fails as it ultimately will you'll be left with absolutely nothing look at Judas Judas loved money he wanted money to make him happy when it didn't work out that way he had nothing left because that's what happens with greed Greed always, 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 always fails the person. It has to, just by definition. Greed can never be satisfied. Greed is never, ever satisfied. You can have billions of dollars and not be happy because you can't be satisfied because you know that there's still more to get. That's how it works. That's why greed is so deadly. The other thing we talk about is that one of the goals of greed is happiness. The other, security. People thinking that if they have enough of everything, they'll feel safe. They'll feel secure. They'll feel certain that the unexpected challenges of this life are not going to get them down. That they'll be able to meet all of those challenges. And so, people go out and try to, to buy something that ultimately is nowhere to be found. This whole idea, it's come very specifically, very prominently bubbled up in America, particularly since 9-11, when everyone wants to be safe from everything and thinking that if we just do this and we do that and we do this and we spend this and we, and we buy security cameras and we hire guards, oh, oh then we're going to feel safe. Now, I don't say any of those things are necessarily wrong, but when we trust in them to provide a total package where you're really going to feel safe all the time, going to fail. Going to fail. Because it cannot be done. Cannot be done. Even presidents, with all the security that they have around them, still get assassinated. It doesn't work. The greed, the greed of trying to amass something for a goal that is unattainable is bound to fail. And not only is it bound to fail, it's idolatrous. That's what the scripture said. So Paul said very specifically. He said anyone who's immoral, impure, or greedy is an idolater. Which means what? It means they've replaced trust in God with trust in stuff. That's idolatry. Judas was an idolater. He placed his trust in money. Obviously. And it failed him miserably. Anyone who does that comes to a point oh yes it's an inevitable point. It will happen. Oh, temporarily? 
Oh, temporarily there could be a lot of happiness. Temporarily there could be a lot of fun. Temporarily you can feel pretty good about yourself. But then comes the inevitable problem. The inevitable disease. The inevitable accident. The inevitable betrayal. The inevitable death. Yes, you all know we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And then what does anything of this world matter? Anything. Do the millions and billions in the bank make a difference? Does all the security in the world make a difference? Oh, and behold, that angel of death can still come even with security systems all around. This is why greed is so dangerous. This isn't just a fun little thing. This isn't just a little kid taking three cookies instead of just one. This is about a relationship with God. Now, the whole point about this entire deal overcoming greed by the cross of Christ. Okay? So, the cross of Christ has to come and enter our lives. Jesus Christ comes, has to deal with that sinful nature that we have. Happens at baptism. Gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to put it down and to say, no, there's a better way. Don't look to the world for your true happiness. Don't look to the world for your security because it's not going to be there. Instead, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. You want happiness? You want happiness? There's something even greater. It's called joy. A joy, a deep-seated contentment, knowing that you are the most precious person in all the created universe to the creator himself. That he made all of this for you and he brought his own son into this world to save you when you screwed it up. And he has deigned to call you his own child. And he smiles at you. And he loves you. And he holds you and he embraces you. Here's a joy that lasts beyond the bonds of this world and a joy that's present not just when things are fun, but that is there in the hospital bed. At night when you're crying because someone hurts you terribly. Even when you're laying on your deathbed, there's a joy and security? Security? Ha! Again, where do you find it in this world? Oh, spend billions and billions and billions all you want. But where are you really going to find it? In the free gift that comes from the cross of Christ. The security that says all your guilt is pardoned. Your iniquities are washed away. You are crowned with a glory that cannot be taken from you and a life that will be yours forever. Not even death. Forget the bullet of a terrorist. Forget, forget, forget the mugging that happens in the, in the street. Forget the abuse that comes from a, a neglectful and terrible husband. Death itself defeated, powerless, impotent. You are safe. You are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. Greed takes that away. Greed doesn't know anything about that. Greed is hopeless. Greed 
ends up just leading to death and despair, Judas killed himself. But when we understand about Jesus, we can overcome that greed, overcome it in such a way, such a way that we live just the opposite, because indeed we repent. We turn from and turn to. Turn from the greed, just give me more and more and more, to Jesus. I'm going to give and give and give some more. Because my Lord Jesus gave everything for me, and he's reposited that in me, and now he tells me to go and live a life of love just as Christ loved me and gave himself for me. (laughs) What a difference. What an incredibly, totally different way of living. And it's yours. It's your treasure. It's your ability as the children of God to be able to do And even if it doesn't change the world, it can make a huge, huge difference in the life of a friend, your child, your grandchild, your spouse, your neighbor, maybe someone you just meet on the street. We get past the greed and get to the giving, the giving of the love that is ours in Christ Jesus. That's repentance. That's repentance. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds then in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue now with the offering. During the, the prayer should I begin with a responsive reading. Would you please stand for that? O oh Lord, let your mercy be upon us. Hear our prayer, O Lord. And let our cry come you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And we pray. Heavenly Father, we do confess that we are by nature greedy people. And we have not yet put that completely behind us. Many times we want more and more and more. Many times we refuse to be content with what we have. And we make other things our God instead of you. We honestly admit that. We bring it before you and ask for your pardon. And then we know that you indeed forgive us. You forgive us not for our sake, but for the sake of Jesus, who was willing to bear our punishment in his own body so that we could be freed. And so now we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will help us to overcome our greed completely and that we can indeed live a life of love in obedience to your great commands. Help us to be people who give, who are more concerned about sharing, who are going to be simply the instruments through which your love is brought into this dark, dark world. Help us to do that joyfully. Help us to do it securely, knowing that we are your children and that nothing, nothing will ever be able to take that away from us and that we shall indeed bear the crown of eternal life in your presence one day soon. So bless us, dear God, and help us to be a truly repentant people. Lord God, we also ask for your blessings today to be with Mike Fine. A challenging week and challenging months for him as he deals with leukemia. We thank you that the radiation and chemotherapy treatments have now been completed. uh, That that should have taken care of the leukemia in his body. We know very well it has uh, indeed done damage to his immune system. But we pray that the cord blood transplant that he will receive on Friday will be effective uh, in restoring his immune system to good health again. We know it's going to take months for that to happen, and so we pray, dear God, that you bless him with your presence, that you heal him by your grace, and that you give him the strength to look forward to the days, indeed, of your great grace. Continue to bless Lyndon Luke, Adele Norgrant, Dean Tordson, Dorothy Shepard, all the other people we name in our hearts, those who have challenging physical issues, those who are dealing with emotional and spiritual challenges as well. We commend them into your hands and ask your God that you look out for them and bless them by your grace. Be with all the members of our congregation who are in care centers and especially Gertrude Holzerland as she receives hospice care. May every day be lived in the expectation of the fulfillment of your promises in Jesus Christ. We pray all this, dear Jesus, in your name. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. And the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Thank you again for being here. Go in peace and serve the Lord.